Hello, and thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. We're just going to wait another couple of moments as we allow our attendees to log on and we get our panelists all. But we are going to kickstart very soon with this latest in the series of worldwide pandemic European responses. Können Sie mich jetzt hören? Geht das so? Yes, Gabrielle, thank you very much for joining us. We're just going live now. So with that, I will say thank you to all our guests for joining us. Today is the second installment of this series of the Heinrich Ball Stiftung's EU office and the Green European Foundation. The series is Worldwide Pandemic European Responses. And today we're asking what future for economic and monetary policy in the EU in light of the current crisis. Obviously, it's a big challenge. It's something that is top of our thoughts at the moment as we try to come out of this very difficult phase. Um, the aim of these series of events is to provide space for transnational exchange and analysis of the ongoing situation and its implications for our societies. Now, we're broadcasting live for you on Facebook and on YouTube, and I do encourage you to ask your questions or make comments in the comment section, and we will try to get to those. But as I said, we have three excellent speakers for you today. So I'm going to begin by introducing Ernest Bertelsen, member of the European Parliament for the Greens EFA group, and member, of course, of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, which is going to be very relevant to our discussion today. We also have Gabriel Ella Mitalich, who is the economist and political scientist, a lecturer at Vienna and Klagenfurt University, and guest professor in Beijing, Budapest, and Istanbul. Thank you, Gabriela, for bringing that international dynamic. And finally, last but by no means least, we have Piero Thierry Filippona, who is head of research and advocacy at Finance Watch. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you all to give us some opening comments, set out the situation we're in, and give us your thoughts for our discussion that we're going to have in the second half of this hour. Ernest, I'm going to start with you. Okay, thank you so much for inviting. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be uh, with you this morning, this afternoon, actually, already. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll start by, by, just by, by saying that the, well, the, resp the European response at the very beginning uh, of the crisis was uh, extremely limited. Uh, we just had uh, uh, responses on the economic front at the national level, uh, with different member states reacting, depending very much on the, uh, the fiscal space they had. This is still the case. I mean, we have uh, countries who are able to uh, uh, react and spend and intervene in the economy at the larger extent than others, depending on their fiscal space. And of course, this is creating a distortion of, of uh, inside the single market. It's not the same if you are a company today in a specific sector, dependently if you're based in one country or another, depending if you have more support from your government you have a, or you have less support. That is why, that's why in the parliament, we have been calling so much uh, for this European recovery uh, fund because this is a way of guaranteeing uh, a, a level playing field so that all because of the economy that are in need uh, can uh, uh, receive help, can receive a boost, uh, th that there will be investment in all parts of Europe, uh, no matter what uh, are the different fiscal buffers that diff the different countries uh, do have. So that that, that, that was uh, important also. This point is important to explain why do we need this, uh, this recovery fund. Now, on the recovery package, I think that um, it's a milestone for the EU integration. Uh, I think that after Maastricht, uh, and after the, the put in place of the of the of the single currency, probably the biggest revolution has been on the at the front of the monetary policy in the last years. So from the last crisis, we ended with a, a completely reshaped role for the ECB uh, with all the instruments that Mario Draghi put in place. So now we have effectively, even though this is not recognized openly, but we have a, 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 mon a monetary authority who fights spreads in Europe who intervenes uh, in the sovereign markets at the in the secondary markets um, uh, so and and that has put in place a certain number of unconventional uh, policies which are extremely uh, important for the eurozone to happen so but but that happened in the last crisis i mean the new development in this, this crisis is that for the first time and let's see what happens during the weekend we'll have joint debt instruments to do common investment of course this is going to be very limited if you take the grants component of the proposal of the Commission, we're only talking about half a trillion uh, of it. And let's again, let's see what happens during the weekend. Uh, so this is very limited. Uh, I mean, uh, EU's GDP is around 19 trillion. Uh, so this is this would account of uh, a, a common indebtedness 
for the for the EU, which accounts of around two three percent maximum of its GDP. So the amount is very limited. Uh, but still, it's a milestone that has been uh, reached. Uh, uh, for the first time, we'll have joint uh, debt issued by the federal institution uh, to make direct transfers and investments. Because while well, issuing joint debt, this we do have already. A bond of the EIB uh, is, uh, is uh, common debt. But of course, it's, the whole difference is whether this instrument, you use it to provide uh, liquidity, to provide loans, or to provide a direct transfer, a direct investment. And this is the big change now. And this is a, a big milestone that, is, that uh, will be that has been reached with the proposal. And another one, which I think is very important, is the whole debate of the own resources of the European Union. The the package is revolutionary also because it proposes to repay its debt through own resources. Uh, it doesn't specify. So the the proposal of the Commission doesn't specify exactly. Uh, how uh, this will be done. Uh, it, it leaves open different scenarios. This, this probably is one of the weakest points of the proposal of the Commission. Um, but indeed, I think that the, the, the need to repay this debt will accelerate um, issues that have been uh, blocked for years, such as uh, new taxes related to plastic, such as uh, uh, probably uh, the, uh, the financial transaction tax, uh, probably as well, we'll need to look at uh, the CCCTV, the Common Consolidated Tax Base Directive, which is blocked in the Council. So different measures that have to provide new resources to uh, the European Union. Uh, this will be uh, also uh, revolutionary in a way, because when we when this debt will be issued, if we do not develop those own resources, then it will have to be for the member states to repay the debt that has been issued and i don't know i i don't think any member state would like to do that and that is why i think uh, we will have an acceleration of the issue of of, of the own resources mm -hmm. so that this is going mm -hmm. these two things are going to be added as a revolutionary i would say development in in our eurozone and that i think is very important we have another issue uh, which uh, uh, still uh, is completely blocked and that for the moment uh, we do not have major developments uh, but I think it's important for the future of the Eurozone, which is the issue of taxation and how do we organize uh, uh, our taxes at EU level. I see that uh, uh, after the crisis, um, uh, or now with the crisis of the, of the coronavirus, uh, this debate is more present in the agenda. So this is already something important, but we don't have yet anything firm uh, on the table to start, for instance, uh, challenging uh, the fiscal dumping at EU level, uh, the rulings at national level uh, who facilitate profit shifting of multinationals. Um, I'm saying that because we just had the ruling from the uh, uh, from the general uh, from the general court in Luxembourg uh, um, annulling the fine that was imposed at Apple. That that was extremely bad news yesterday. Probably you followed that. Uh, but in a way, as Greens in the European Parliament, we, we, we reacted to this by saying that this is a proof this, that we absolutely need to change our different, uh, our different uh, uh, norms that we have that, uh, that govern our taxation system in the EU. So also for you to know that the Parliament has just created a subcommittee on taxation matters, a permanent one. This is an all uh, request on the side of the Greens. Um, and that will exist. It will start working in, in September um, together with my colleagues Van Giegel and Kira uh, from the uh, from the, from Denmark, we will be the members there, uh, and I think that our role will be basically to push for those issues, huh? to build a common consolidated uh, uh, tax base for the EU, to go for the the, the very famous um, uh, CBCR, the the tax transparency for multinationals, which which the, the, uh, which uh, is very important, and also to see how do we break this unanimity rule uh, at the council level in uh, on taxation matters. So, no big development no big revolution on that front for now uh, but the debate is there and, and this i think is going to be our, our one of our priorities and last but not least and i will end here because i was given 10 minutes it's already eight so i'm uh, i'm gonna end here how all this contributes to the green deal and of course this is uh, extremely important and one thing it's uh, we are uh, saying from the queens of the european parliament very clearly is that there is not not such thing as the European recovery uh, and on the other hand the European Green Deal. Those things need to be the same. And just for you to know that we are now uh, having a strong battle uh, also in Brussels on the conditionalities of the recovery plan when it comes to the transition. 
So we want in the different regulations, and also this is something probably that the Parliament will call in its resolution in the, um, uh, that we will be voting when the uh, European Council reaches an agreement. We want really that this money puts all the economies on track to reach uh, the Paris Agreement targets of the energetic transition. So that would be it. And thanks very much for your invitation. Thank you very much. I and mean, I will come back to you probably with some more questions regarding uh, taxation around possibly own resources and maybe the digital tax. We'll talk a little bit later about that. Gabrielle, let me turn to you now. Uh, you have 10 minutes to tell us your position, what you think is going to happen. Over to you. Yeah, in contrast to this rather optimistic view of the recover, recovery plan, I, I feel somehow reminded of 2008 and I think that the main problem with, the, with this recovery plan is that its basic neoliberal character um, still remains. And what seems to be a somehow Keynesian approach actually is uh, is not the Keynesian, but the neoliberal approach. I mean, the, the two main focuses of the recovery program are the healthcare system on the one hand and businesses on the other. Uh, so it actually certainly means a lot of transfer to the to the business community once more, even if uh, small and medium-sized enterprises are mentioned as one focus, I think it's still a huge transfer uh, to capital and not taking into account what uh, uh, employment, how employment really uh, develops. And uh, the, the, the internal demand uh, is not really a focus of this plan. So, um, for example, what's going to happen with un long-term unemployment? I don't think that the crisis will be over in a few months. So, um, what's about the long-term? What's about the social security system? Because it's actually not only the healthcare system that's so crucial in this crisis, but um, the whole social security system and all social security systems in Europe have been uh, cut back enormously uh, during this uh, austerity uh, policy. So um, on the other hand, we have a lot of invisible unemployment, informal employment, which uh, lacks access uh, to um, unemployment benefits. And this concerns um, immigrants uh, a lot. So not addressing these issues also means probably a fostering nationalist um, movements and nationalist parties in the member states, which at the same time, of course, also mean a huge um, boundary or um, for uh, common action, actually. And uh, this issue of inequality and specifically um, really exclusion of immigrants is also addressed by the OECD in during the or was also addressed by the OECD in its last report so i think the problem with the whole recovery plan if you take the let's say the structure of it is that it's not really focusing on social inequality which could be which actually is a main destabilizing factor for the whole european union and which will probably um, further um, strengthen nationalist uh, developments and as far as climate change is concerned i mean about 30 percent of this recovery program uh, shall be directed towards measures on climate change. But I cannot see any sort of struct structural change uh, with regards of <clears throat> a, steady, a steady state economy, a degrowth perspective. Of course, this cannot be 
expected from this sort of European Union we have. But on the other hand, that's what we need if we really want to combat uh, climate change. And uh, so I think it's uh, in particular from a green perspective, it's not really um, very satisfying. Um, in and let's say what what seems uh, very um, indicative for this or uh, illustrate illustrative for this uh, current situation we are in is that the vice uh, the vice president of the European Commi Commission um, said in an interview a few days ago that immediately after the crisis, we will, of course, turn back to the budget restrictions. To uh, So what I'm really scared of is a more, more, une more inequality in the European Union and then, um, again, a huge uh, austerity program. So I'm altogether not uh, that optimistic and I think that the this attempt to save capitalism in Europe is actually risking to strengthen uh, nationalism and finally uh, further disintegrate the European Union actually. Thank you. Okay, well, we've had two quite differing perspectives. Thierry, uh, where do you fall between these two? Well, I don't know. We're going to see. Um, what I'd like to do, perhaps, is not choose a camp, but try to put in perspective the issues that seem to be coming up when we look at the unprecedented fiscal and monetary support to the economy that we were witnessing, uh, we have been witnessing for the for the past uh, for the past few months. Because regardless of what happens next weekend, you know, at EU level, we've seen an unprecedented uh, level of fiscal support at national level for the past uh, few few months. Obviously, depending on on the member states, it's been it's taken different forms. But uh, but um, you know, certainly in many countries, and you know, certainly in Germany, but uh, not only in Germany, the level of fiscal support has been has been enormous, and also of of monetary support at at uh, at the central bank level. These two supports, in 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 my view, raise a fundamental question because they did not distinguish between different segments of the economy and basically they supported the economy it's in in its entirety on the one hand you can understand why that was the case because you needed to 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 make sure that life was going on uh, in the midst of this uh, health crisis that brought the economy to standstill so we we understand it was probably you know if you take a firefighter um, hat on uh, the best thing to do but when you think about the consequences certainly for the fiscal support if you support the entire economy effectively the sort of economy you're building is a state-run economy on the downside when it goes badly and a market economy on the upside when things go well and certainly this is not without consequences this is fundamentally called moral hazard and here again, I'm not saying that public authorities should not have done what they have done. I'm just saying that this raises questions that need to be answered if political leaders want to give the right answers for the right reasons on an informed basis. On the monetary support of financial markets, um, let's put things in perspective. And this goes way beyond the, 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 the COVID-19 crisis. For the past 25 years, really, both in the US and, and in the EU, we've seen an, an unwritten mandate of central banks to support financial markets. You know, in, in, in the times where Alan Greenspan was, was the chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, there was the so-called Greenspan put, which effectively, effectively said that each time financial markets were going down, the Fed would intervene to support financial markets. 
And then we had, you know, the Bernanke put, and we had the Draghi put in Europe. And very interestingly, in early March, Christine Lagarde at one point said, I'm not here to close spreads. In other words, she was saying, I'm not here to support financial markets. And the reaction to her saying that was very, very violent. I mean, she was harshly criticized for saying that. And a few days later, she led probably the biggest support the ECB ever brought to financial markets in order to make sure that uh, the whole world was not collapsing. We have built collectively a world where we cannot afford to see financial markets go down because effectively, if financial markets go down drastically, financial stability is a threat because the stability of banks and insurance companies, among others, there's other actors as well, is linked to the level of financial markets. So there's an unwritten mandate of central banks to support financial markets. But very much like on fiscal policy, where we where we're saying, you know, we, we, we're sort of creating a system where, you know, on, on, on the downside, it's, you know, it's for the public pocket and on the upside, it's for the private pocket. Well, effectively on financial markets, it's exactly the same thing. You know, we're seeing support by public money, you know, central banks intervention, mm -hmm. and that has the same consequences. And that has very, very strong um, consequences. The third dimension that I think um, our leaders have to have in mind when, when it comes to all those recovery packages is that if they support unsustainable economic activities, they will feed disruption risk. What I call disruption risk is exactly what we saw during the COVID-19 crisis, i.e. a sanitary crisis, a sustainability crisis, impacting the economy and the impact on the economy impacts the financial system in turn. And if we had something very drastic with the COVID, the impact of climate change will be several orders of magnitude much bigger than, than, than the COVID crisis. So if we don't invest in a sustainable economy and if we don't stop investing in an unsustainable economy, then we can be sure that we will feed disruption risk and the consequences of that not that far from now will be dramatic. Um, let's bear in mind that the carbon budget of the planet is between 10 and 15 years. In 10 to 15 years, we will have exhausted the carbon budget of the planet, i.e. we will have reached a point where global warming will be beyond the two degree level. So we have to invest today, now, into a green economy and stop investing in an unsustainable economy. And that is for sure. And that leads us to a very, very crucial point it, that really relates to what, what, um, what, um, what was just said about uh, the repayment of debt and potential austerity. Uh, effectively, it is impossible today <coughs> It is technically impossible. I don't think this is a political choice. And it's not a partisan choice. It is a technical choice. It is impossible to think of a sustainable level of debt in an unsustainable economy, in an unsustainable world. Very often, we talk about sustainability of debt. And before the crisis, everybody is saying, OK, sustainability of debt means you, know, you must not go be beyond the, you know, 3% um, uh, deficit uh, of GDP deficit and 60% and uh, um, uh, debt to GDP ratio. Uh, that was, you know, the so-called mantra for, for sustainability of debt. And there were the partisans of, of this orthodoxy, so to speak, and those who were saying, hey, this is not the essential. We need to invest, you know, to, to build a better world, a sustainable world. Well, today, we know that regardless of the scenario, those 3%, 60%, you know, um, stability and growth pact rules will not be respected regardless. So the issue is really to invest in a sustainable economy, because if we don't invest in a sustainable economy, tomorrow's world will not be sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, that goes back to my previous argument about disruption risk, the world will be disrupted. And if the world is disrupted, you can rest assured that the level of sovereign debt will just explode. So. I see as a, as a big paradox to hear people say today that oh, we have to respect the SGP rules in order for that to be sustainable, because this is just an impossibility. I mean, 
there's sort of almost a paradox in saying if you respect so-called date sustainability in the short term, it will not be by definition sustainable in the long term. So this is something very, very important to, 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 to bear in mind and that our policymakers have to, 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 to not to forget. And the last thing, obviously, there's the question of, by the way, okay, debt is going up regardless of the scenario. Uh, what are the possibilities to pay back that debt? Well, and if you generalize, there are five technical, and I'm saying technical options, and then it's the political decisions. But first option to pay back the debt is increase taxes. Second option is decrease expenditure. That's called austerity. Third option is write off the debt. Fourth option is inflation, which is sort of soft way of erasing the debt. And the fifth option, which is not allowed by European treaties today, is direct financing of public budgets by, by central banks. But I think this is the time for all of us, all of us being, you know, people trying to think about, about the future, to think with a new, we, we, we need to switch softwares and we need to realize what money is. And money is just a human creation. It's a convention. And we need to decide how we create money for what purpose. And if you say and think that increasing taxes or decreasing expenditure, in other words, austerity, is not politically, ethically, and socially acceptable, and I do not think it will be accepted in any of the EU countries, if anything, if anything, because the people who were on the front line during the COVID crisis were the least paid. They were, you know, all the ones doing the difficult jobs, and by the way, who are getting the lowest wages. So if you tell those people that, by the way, they're going to be receiving less money than before, effectively, the support brought by, by fiscal, by, by public budget will have been a cash advance as opposed to, you know, I'm supporting you. And, uh, and it, it would come down to saying, oh, please pay me back what I, what I, what I advanced to you uh, during the crisis. I think this is not going to work. This is just not going to work. So what are you left with? You're left with, with monetary solutions. So we need to think creatively about all that. And by the way, we are today in a deflationary world, um, which is all you know, reinforced by the fact that global demand, aggregate demand, as the economists like to put it, has been diminished even further by the COVID crisis. So the general context is deflationary. So creating money, I know it's a big taboo, but creating money, if it's done properly, under control, and done in a deflationary context, could be the most, the, the best way of financing that debt. And I can hear the argument saying, oh, we have to go back to the old ways and, by the way, pay back the debt. But, you know, I'm, I have no interest in being proven right. So uh, if someone explains to me that there's another way than from, apart from the five ways I just explained to pay back the debt, I'm very happy to debate it and, and, and to admit there's another way. But I'm not seeing any other way than basically monetary financing of, of public budgets to, to, to come to that solution. But very, very, very importantly, uh, we have to forget that we cannot have a sustainable sovereign debt in an unsustainable world. And that is something that we will not escape from. And to me, this is the center of, of, of the whole debate. Maybe I'll stop here and you know, yeah. we discuss. Thank you very much. Um, some some big thoughts there um, that we really going to have to try and tackle in the next half hour. I mean, one of the questions that we had on the agenda for today was, what are the risks and potentially the opportunities for the EU directly borrowing money on the financial markets? Um, Ernest, let me let me put that to you. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I think this is a good development. Uh, uh, we are in a in a single currency, and uh, we indeed need uh, joint debt instruments. Uh, this is what the the call for euro bonds has been for years. Um, uh, we need a European asset, uh, and we need financial means to be issued uh, through debt, like a like a majority of uh, of monetary unions do. So I think this is a positive development. Of course, one could argue uh, this is a burden for future.
generations and there's a lot of people saying this money needs to be invested in climate change because it needs to be invested on the needs of future generations i fully agree on that but uh, more than a uh, more than a burden for future generations i see it as an essential instrument uh, for the governance of the eurozone now what happens with that debt i want to jump that immediately to uh, what my uh, previous uh, colleagues here have uh, have uh, have mentioned and is there a risk of auster for austerity uh, as you know, the, the stability and growth pact is suspended. The Commission is not talking about reintroducing it in 2022. Uh, for me, it's very unlikely that we will get out of this crisis with the same parameters that we had when we introduced the single, the single currency and established in the SGP. There's no way we can keep the rule of the 60% limit of debt uh, through the GDP ratio because we will be we'll go out of that uh, of the crisis with uh, with uh, very high. Um, that levels. Uh, and one thing I want to be, make very clear is that we are absolutely trying on the side of the parliament to decouple the recovery fund with the, the respect uh, of, the, um, of, of those fiscal rules or the so-called macroeconomic conditionality. That would be completely madness. Some countries are pushing for that, but we are totally against that because this is an instrument of issuing debt at the EU level to do European investment. This is one thing. The other thing is how uh, member states manage their finances. This is another thing. So we are trying completely to separate two things. It would be a mistake to put them together. And, and frankly speaking, I, I do believe that the debate on, on austerity will come again in one or two years. There will be a political battle around that. I'm totally, I'm, I'm fully aware of this. But I'm more of the opinion, like the previous speaker said, that we will need to be used of, high, of having higher debt levels and that there are tools to manage that. There are monetary tools. You can address that through taxation. You can address that to a policy mix who promotes a, a sustainable and manageable level of inflation to make that that burden uh, uh, reduced. But I think, and I completely agree with the with what the colleague from Finance Watch, Finance Watch said, uh, there's no way public opinions will accept again austerity. So we'll need to find new ways of manage that. Thank you, Gabriella. Did you want to react to to what you heard from Thierry as well? Yeah, actually, I think we are somehow in a constant situation of austerity. I mean, even now, it's not that, you know, that the majority of the population really gains from these, um, uh, all these measures, not taking um, employment into account. Of course, there is a certain stabilization of employment, but... Uh, there is no um, increase of unemployment benefits. There is no increase in social security. Uh, inequality is rising. Um, it, it, it seems very obvious that uh, the result of the crisis will be a huge or further concentration of capital. So um, I'm not so sure whether there will not be any austerity policies afterwards, because um, the balance of power uh, is uh, becomes more and more asymmetric. So uh, I, I think the situation is much more uh, complicated uh, if you take so society, social developments on so society's uh, disintegrative tendencies into account. Because, uh, in, I mean, for example, the, the frugal four could not really, I mean, we will see, but uh, up to now it seems that they have no chance to really to blo blockade this uh, or to block this, uh, this program. But uh, what if Germany experiences a further uh, growth of the, the extreme right? And if the, if the governmental parties just, you know, as some sort of calculus uh, take, uh, take um, less effort to push through uh, more solidarity in Europe. So I think the situation is not that clear and I'm not that optimistic, actually. Because I think that the, 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 the fractions, the gaps in very rich societies, such as the German and the Austrian, uh, are huge and they are growing enormously. 
Okay, Thierry, I want to ask you a bit about time frames. Now, I know we none of us have a, a crystal ball, but in terms of predicting how long this corona crisis is going to be a crisis, but you know, at EU level, we're talking about the multi-annual financial framework, which is seven years. Do you think those two, is, there a, is that the right time frame, or do we need to readjust our, our way of thinking? Well, thinking seven years ahead is already pretty good. If we if we manage to do that in a in a coherent way, I think it's 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 it, you know it's probably the right perspective. Uh, given the unknowns we have anyway on on the health crisis itself, nobody knows what what you know what it will be, what it will become. One thing is sure is that okay, we have and I'm not here to be a doomsayer, but we have this crisis today. But given the predictable sustainability crises that the world is going to go through over the coming decades, we have to adjust our economies, I would say structurally, to deal with an entirely new world. And I think this COVID crisis is just, and here again, I'm not predicting anything gloomy and I'm not a doomsayer or anything, but it's just, it's just the, you know, the sign of what it means dealing with an, a, a society that is not built on sustainable parameters and and unsustainability lack of sustainability is the new parameter of our economies and you know for a very very long time you know we we had discussions and i've been part of those discussions for many years saying okay you have the financial sector and parameters and reporting and factors and you have the non-financial parameters reporting and factors the reality is that the non-financial has a direct impact on the economy that has direct impact, impact on finance. So, you know, we have to think long term, and that goes back to, 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 to your question about time frame, because this is the new way of thinking. Hence the fact that I was saying that we have to, to, to switch softwares, we have to think differently. And, and the old rules, and it was very interesting to, to, to hear Ernest say, look, you know, SGP, 3%, 60% rules, you know, forget about it. And I could not agree more. I mean, those are, first of all, as we all know, arbitrary and artificial rules. You know, we could debate about their merits or their lack of merits, but they're they pure convention. So this is time to reinvent our rules, reinvent our conventions, um, and for the long run. Okay, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to be a little bit of a, a doomsayer here because we did, you know, have we learned from the past? This is not the first crisis to to hit Europe or or the globe. Um, I mean, and I'm not just thinking about the financial crisis, but even things like the Asian tsunami. I mean, have we learned? I mean, we don't seem to have, Ernest. Well, it's it's early to say. Eh? It's early to say. Uh, but uh, but indeed, I think that the treatment uh, that the European institutions are giving to this crisis, what we can already say is that the responses are different from last time. So last time, basically, what we did is we left all the financial burden to react to the crisis up to the member states. We started the crisis with uh, an ECB who was not sustaining the debt issuance of the national member states. So that led to the to the spread crisis, and then we intervened certain economies, uh, we, uh, sending uh, men in black to the capitals to do massive cuts in public services. That, that that's the story of the last crisis, eh? and this is what led to uh, huge levels of inequality in in, in lots of um, of places in Europe, and 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 the scars, the scars of that period are still there. Uh, are we responding like that this time? Well, the answer, I think, is evidently no. One, I'm myself very critical, and I would like to do much more than what we are doing. But now we are talking about uh, issuing joint debt to do common investment for uh, half a trillion. Is that enough? No, the parliament asked for the trillions. Uh, will, that let, will that be a, the magical solution to all our problems? No. But is it different from last crisis? Absolutely. Yes, it is. Uh, but but I agree, having said so, I agree that there's a legitimate doubt about what will happen in two years when we, uh, member states, will, will, will be asked to consolidate, to, to consolidate the public finances. Yes, there will be a political battle there. And I am sure that the austerity hawks will come back to the public debate and will push for that. And there will be a political battle to be fight there. And I think that the progressive forces, we need to 
really uh, work together in order to avoid that and 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 more and 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 walk more towards the past that uh, that Thierry was describing in its first intervention of how to manage debt and our public finances in the future. But to but to react to your immediate question, are we giving a different answer this time from 2008? I think the answer has to be yes. Okay, I'm going to turn now. We have a question that has come in um, from the comments, so from our audience, from the Green Economics Institute, asking for some concrete policy proposals that are required on EU level from all speakers. So, um, as an MEP, Ernest, I'm going to come back to you again to try and answer that. What are the concrete policy proposals that, that you would like to see? The concrete, sorry, again, you didn't hear it. Concrete policy proposals that's required on EU level. Well, I think that just to maybe f focused on, on, on one particular issue that is important for us. Uh, for us, it would be really a mistake to consider the recovery fund one instrument that has nothing to do with the Green Deal. With the green deal. That would be a big mistake. We are trying to fight that. We are extremely unhappy about the lack of conditionalities that different member states are putting to their companies when they receive support. There is also the whole debate of what's the role of, of, of the state when it intervenes the companies that, that Thierry was mentioning before. I'm not getting into that because this is a very long discussion, but I want to focus on the green conditionalities we put when we pump in money into the into our economy. And we have positive, exa positive examples. Uh, so uh, Renault has been put under certain conditions. Uh, but for instance, the intervention of, of Lufthansa in Germany, the nationalization of Lufthansa in Germany came at the practically non-existing green uh, green conditions. That is bad. That is negative. Or my country in Spain, where we have intervened the car industry with uh, putting no green condition at all. Uh, we are very worried about that. And now what we are trying to do at European level is that the recovery fund has very clear green conditionalities. And in the regulation that the Commission has proposed, that is already on the table for the uh, resilience and recovery facility, um, there's, there are not, not, not many uh, strong conditionalities in the legal text. So this is one critical goal that we have as Greens, is that in those legal texts, uh, the green conditionalities for the national recovery plans that will be developed to use that money that will be borrowed uh, in common in the markets are strong. Gabriella, same question to you then. What sort of concrete policy proposals do you envisage that you think would be helpful? Well, actually, I would stress once more uh, that sustainability actually means getting rid of a form of economy which depends on growth. I think this is the basic line and there there are absolutely no no thoughts on this actually we we have very little knowledge even how to really transform the economy uh, we can I, I i am convinced we cannot manage this within a capitalist framework and uh, the fights during the next years uh, will certainly be about this I mean, is, what's actually happening now is a form of uh, rescuing capitalism and uh, securing uh, the well-established uh, power relations. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's what cannot be maintained. So it, it's maybe inevitable that there will be enormous social um, struggles during the next years. Um, I think what's what seems really important to me now as a very concrete example for, let's say, creating more sustainability for the lowest segment uh, of the population is some sort of um, universal uh, basic uh, income. Because it's, uh, I mean, I know in Spain it has been introduced, but in many other countries, uh, despite all this enormous growth of uh, unemployment and poverty, actually, uh, which is not that visible right now, but will become more and more visible. Uh, I think this is one of the really urgent measures we should uh, take into account. I have just a follow up for you, Gabriel, on that. I mean, hearing what you're saying. 
What role would you see that the EU should have in this? You know, I mean, we, we talk a lot about member state uh, responsibilities and competencies, but do you see a role for the EU? Well, actually, there was this European um, civil initiative on a um, common European basic income. Uh, and I think that the European Union could by enhancing uh, common, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, we'll leave I'm, it. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I just okay. cannot remember the word. Um, let's say by enhancing common revenues, um, Offered, offered a chance to really to realize a, a, such a European-wide uh, uh, basic income. Okay. Thierry, uh, moving on to you, what are your suggestions for concrete policies? Um, several, really. And if I can very briefly relate that to the question you asked Ernest about, you know, um, are public authorities reacting the same way they reacted um, 12 years ago to the financial crisis? And, and when he said no, he was right, but maybe you can add a little nuance because 12 years ago in the financial crisis, obviously the, 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 the chain of causes and consequences is completely different. We all agree on that. But what we collectively did 12 years ago is basically we brought public money to support private interests. That's called moral hazard. That's called head I win, tail you lose. And we say the financial system on that was running on a moral hazard basis. What we're doing in this crisis is that we're extending the moral hazard logic beyond the financial system to the entire economic system. And we're building something that is, in my view, not coherent. You know, you can choose for one system or the other, but you, if you have that asymmetrical share of revenues and, and, and losses, it will not work because you will not have the right incentives and the right responsibilities. So, and that leads us directly to what should be done or perhaps not done and concrete policy proposals. First of all, and well, that, that's, you know, that goes back to, to, what, um, to what Ernest was saying, you know, I'll say it in slightly different words, but it comes down to the same thing. You know, I think there should be a sustainability proofing of public money allocated to the economy. If the money allocated to the economy does not go to sustainable activities, we are, this is tantamount for our societies to committing suicide. I'm sorry, I'm very abrupt, but this is, this is the reality. Now, the next question obviously is, uh, what do you do with all the people who are un in unsustainable activities? Well, the money that should not go to unsustainable activities should go into supporting the people working for those enterprises because obviously they're not responsible for that. So they should be trained to work in sustainable activities. And in any case, they should be given the means of living a decent life because, you know, that's cool. You know, often we talk about the just transition but it is, this is absolutely indispensable. And, and we remember the word of Mario Draghi saying, you know, he would do whatever it takes to save financial markets. Well, if we can do whatever it takes to save, to save financial markets, we should be able to do whatever it takes to, to, to not to leave millions and dozens of millions of people on the side of the road. So this is absolutely the essential. Uh, the third thing is that the lack of conditionality, and that's, that was said already, but I, I completely support that, is, is something that will lead us you know, into a brick wall. So <clears throat> three policy proposals are sustainability proofing, support to the people who are in unsustainable activities, and, um, and you know, put very strict conditionality uh, in order to avoid to, to, to develop that hybrid economic system that will lead us uh, really nowhere. Um, Ernest, I want to ask you about whether you think now is, in terms of a turning point, um, whether there might be some positives to come out of this crisis we're in. 
it's it's um, it's difficult to say um, uh, more than a turning point because that, that those are strong words i would say we have uh, positive developments at geo level in in terms of instruments and uh, and moving forward in debate that were blocked for years as i said at the beginning so in that sense yes but then we have huge challenges and things that uh, are still a big question mark eh? the debate about what will happen with the management of debt in two, three years is legitimate. Uh, let's see how this ends. And then maybe also to jump on the issue of the moral hazard that Thierry was mentioning, which I fully agree with uh, with what he said. Um, I think that um, one of the uh, key issues that we need to focus on is how uh, the public authorities are intervening in the economy. Uh, so this is done through different ways. Uh, we have, for instance, the possibility of providing uh, loans to companies uh, with public guarantees. Okay, this is one way. But the other way, of course, uh, is um, is becoming is that the state becomes a shareholder of certain company, which is something that I personally do prefer. Uh, but if you if the state and the uh, uh, becomes a shareholder of certain companies, it it has to uh, exercise its rights. One of the things I didn't like from the intervention of Lufthansa is this idea of having the state as a passive state holder, which means I enter the capital of the company, but I put no conditions to that. Uh, it goes back to the debate of the conditionality. So I think that, yes, there's a whole debate in order to avoid this moral hazard that, 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 that Thierry was very rightly mentioning on how do we intervene uh, the, um, the, um, uh, the public sector. And then there's another topic on the negative side of the developments that I want to mention as well, which is very important, and Thierry knows a lot, a lot about that for sure, he can tell, is what is happening with the financial sector. Because here I have to say, we, I have a much more critical view, because we are indeed, in order to boost uh, credit to the real economy, we are giving all sorts of facilities, advantages and privileges to the financial sector, lowering the standards and the requirements uh, when they uh, when they manage their own capital uh, and this has been done through the reform of certain legislation at the eu level and this is really worrying so one of the things on the worrying side that we need to very closely look at is all the, this new uh, wave of privileges that the financial sector is getting uh, uh, through the uh, through those measures that uh, are being are, be, are being put in place Okay, I'm going to take um, another question from our audience, from Alessandro Molinari, who is asking, is a change of the EU emission trading system needed to hasten the green transition? Uh, Thierry, would you like to answer that one? The EU emissions trading system, is there changes required? Well, the EU emission, I mean, there's two levels in the answer. The first level is, do you really want to transfer to the market what should really be a tax? Because the ETS, EU trading system, is really trying to put a, a tax system in a market format because, uh, because let's call it better paid. Uh, elected officials didn't think they could get it as a, as a tax. So you say, okay, I'm not gonna tax you on your carbon emissions. I'm gonna sell you the right to pollute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, this is a very fundamental question. Is it the way we want to organize our society? And obviously, you know, the answer is, is not very quick and I'm, I'm highly conscious of time. Then the second question is more technical and practical. The trading system being what it is, you know, why is it not working properly? And the answer to this is that the allocation of, 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 of the rights has been much too generous. There's been too many exemptions. And that if you want to, if you want this thing to work really well, to have some effect, put it this way, you must be very, very strict and not give exemptions to, for whatever reasons, to the, some of the, 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 the big emitters of CO2. I'm not saying that this doesn't cause a problem of competitiveness and, and, and all the rest of it to, 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 to those companies. But politically, when you're in charge of public good or the public interest, you have to make a choice. You know, do you see to a number of private interests or do you see the big picture? And the big picture today is that if we don't do something very, very serious about carbon emissions, then we'll all be in very big trouble in not such a distant future. So you know, there's the fundamental issue and then there's the technical reform uh, that, yes, would need to be done uh, if we want that to have some effect. 
Okay, well, uh, we are conscious of time and I think we appear to have lost Gabriella's uh, five minutes from the end. So um, what I want to do is actually just wrap up with a final question uh, to both of you. Um, what, in two minutes, would you say to those leaders meeting uh, in the council uh, this week or tomorrow rather? So what, what is your one message that you want ringing in their ears? Uh, Ernest, you can go first. Well, I would tell them that they need to be up to the challenge. Uh, that is an historical moment for the European Union. If they fail to deliver something that European citizens, citizens perceive as responding to their very difficult circumstances, uh, the European project is going to enter a very difficult phase. So they need to live up to the challenge. And concretely, I will tell them, just to be very concrete, don't don't touch the grant components the half billion uh, half trillion is the minimum that we need don't put macro conditionalities because that will remind the troika times and uh, in some societies that will, that will be really harmful don't do that and please guarantee a democratic governance of the fund give the european parliament the role it deserves thank you and give the european parliament the role it deserves of course you would say that um Thierry, your, your thoughts, what's your, what's your ringing message to, to those leaders meeting this week? I, I would tell them, do invest in the future, because uh, if you don't, we're going to have a very big problem. Stop worrying about the level of debt, because regardless of the scenario, I repeat, regardless of the scenario, debt is going up. So I'm not saying it's, it's negligible, it shouldn't be dealt with. Yes, it needs to be dealt with. But it's, it's a second order variable. First order variable is invest for the future. And investing for the future is, I know it's a very big shortcut, but invest green, i.e. In, sustainable, in a sustainable economy, and stop investing in an unsustainable economy and support the people that will be affected. This is the essential. And then the debt element will need to be dealt with. But by the way, the debate about grant or not grant. I mean, if you say, if you agree, it's a big if, with what I said about anyway, a large proportion of that debt will not be paid back, well, might as well give it. Because, you know, you can, I can give you money and know that you will not pay me back, or I can, no, I can lend you money and know it will not be paid back, or I can give you money. Well, I might as well give you money because, you know, at least there is no fantasy of, you know, why are you not paying back? Well, you gave it to me. Well, what are you talking about? Obviously, the grant is the absolutely obvious solution because any other way of putting it is anyway artificial and will not lead anywhere. I mean, it, you may wish it would be different. That's down to everybody's opinions, but technically it will not happen. So do your grant. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, we hope they've been listening. Maybe they have. We have not managed to cover everything in one hour because, of course, it's a very short time frame uh, for a very big issue. But I do want to thank again the organizers, the Heinrich Ball Schiffstung EU office and the Green European Foundation. Remember, this is a series of events. We're trying to get a discussion going on the worldwide pandemic European responses. So do follow us online, follow us on social media, uh, share these uh, videos with your friends and keep talking about it because it's a big conversation that everyone needs to be a part of. Thank you very much again to our speakers, Ernest, Gabrielle and Thierry, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Have a great afternoon.